the case is of an 80 year old man presenting with expressive dysphasia and visual disturbance. The T2 axial scans demonstrate uh, multifocal abnormalities throughout both cerebral hemispheres. The most striking abnormalities are in the left cerebral hemisphere, in the frontal lobe as well as parietal lobe extending into the posterior temporal lobe. They consist of T2 signal abnormality in the white matter extending into the overlying grey matter. On flare there is widespread high T2 signal with a relatively circumscribed region with some positive mass effect involving the left frontal lobe. This involves Broca's area accounting for the patient's expressive dysphasia. The most striking abnormality is seen on susceptibility weighted imaging. There is extensive signal loss seen over the convexity of the cerebral hemispheres outlining numerous sulci. The posterior fossa is spared from such change. In addition to superficial siderosis, there are numerous punctate regions of susceptibility-induced signal loss scattered peripherally within both cerebral hemispheres. On the limited sequences provided, I do not see an evidence of a vascular malformation, although performing an MRA would be prudent. There is moderately extensive sulcal susceptibility artefact, as well as multiple, at least five or six, parenchymal foci of susceptibility artefact. The other striking feature is loss of signal in a sulcal distribution along the surface of the cerebral hemispheres, more on the left hand side but also on the right. This is associated with more punctate areas of signal loss seen uh, at the corticomedullary junction. The diffusion weighted scan demonstrates uh, multifocal punctate areas of diffusion restriction. In summary, we have extensive superficial siderosis, at least six foci of susceptibility artifact that are intraparenchymal, and extensive white matter abnormality as well as some cortical involvement. Overall, the features are characteristic of cerebral amyloid angiopathy, which in isolation fails to account for the relatively circumscribed region of a flare signal abnormality in the left frontal lobe with mass effect. Assuming a single diagnosis rather than dual pathology, this frontal lobe region most likely represents a circumscribed region of inflammation secondary to cerebral amyloid angiopathy. This is somewhat unimaginatively termed a cerebral amyloid angiopathy related inflammation or cerebral amyloid angiitis. This is a form of a vasculopathy or vasculitis and can lead to areas of mass-like edema. Additionally, it may also account for the punctate regions of diffusion restriction seen elsewhere. My favourite diagnosis is of amyloid angiopathy with microhemorrhages and superficial siderosis. There are slightly greater cortical changes than would be normally expected. These potentially could represent a more inflammatory uh, process such as uh, cerebral amyloid angiopathy related vasculitis rather than the normal changes of cerebral amyloid. Other less likely differential diagnoses would be changes secondary to vasculitis including granulomatous vasculitides and beyond this one would then consider other possibilities that may lead to superficial siderosis. And in this respect, I would suggest that there is some form of vascular imaging performed to ensure there is no vascular abnormality, such as an aneurysm contributing to the siderosis. The superficial staining of the cerebral cortex and sulci with hemosiderin is a key aspect to narrowing the differential diagnosis. While this can happen with amyloid angiopathy, to have such extensive bilateral change would be unusual. We have seen patients presenting uh, in a delayed fashion after subarachnoid hemorrhage who then also have vasospasm related to that and areas of subacute cerebral infarction and that could be further investigated on the MRA and on history. Putting it all together, I think uh, amyloid angiopathy uh, with prior hemorrhages or a, uh, a vasculitis be uh, my favourite diagnosis.